My name is Kenneth Kubernick. I am a native Angelino, from, born on Sunset near Vine, no less. I find myself, though, this afternoon in beautiful Monterey, California, here to celebrate the publication of a brand new book that I co-authored with my brother Harvey called A Perfect Haze, the Illustrated History of the Monterey International Pop Festival, which is a bit of an extravagant title, but the Monterey Pop Festival looms large in the mythology of the Monterey community. It was simply the first and arguably most important of all the legendary rock festivals that defined the 60s and the way we enjoy music so often today at big festivals finds its home and hearth in Monterey. The concert's promoter and producer, Lou Adler, designated us as the official historians. So even though this event took place in the immortal summer of love of 1967, here we are 44 years later, this is the official first ever history of the Monterey Pop Festival. It took place over three days, June 16th, 17th, and 18th. And it is most notable not only for its gathering of the hippie tribes, an event that has come to signify peace, love, and understanding, but it also introduced to the world of music and popular culture such iconic names as Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Who, Otis Redding, Ravi Shankar. These are all musicians whose resonances continue to change and vibrate in our society in many ways. These bands came from all over to stage what was first rock pop festival prior to this Monterey was distinguished, of course, for its Monterey Jazz Festival. And there was also, of course, the Monterey Folk Music Festival. But this was the first time where an electric guitar got its first real airing. And it was a real game changer. And, of course, the community of Monterey was somewhat aghast at the prospect of having hippies descend upon them, almost like locusts or something uh, scary and ravenous. Ironically, it turned out that even the good burgers of Monterey were so charmed by the promoter Lou Adler and his confederate, the Papa, uh, John Phillips of the Mamas and Papas, who co-produced the event with him, that they came to Monterey on several occasions during the course of the run-up to the festival to charm the community leaders and whatever fears and anxieties they had about literally thousands of long-haired kids from San Francisco and wherever coming here they decided that they could indeed break bread with them. And the festival is distinguished by the fact that even though everybody was tripping, there were no arrests, there was not a single incident with the police. In fact, the police went out of their way not to hassle or arrest anyone, provided everybody behaved. And approximately 10,000 people did. Uh, that was the official attendance. There are several thousand more who scattered around the fairgrounds themselves, but the official attendance was about 10,000 per day, so it was a 30,000 total for attendance. And that's another thing that distinguishes it from other big festivals that would come subsequently. You think of Woodstock, you think of the Isle of Wight. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people at these festivals. By contrast, Monterey was almost intimate, held inside uh, nothing more than a horse stall, you might say and yet seem to capture the sense of a community coming together and not just simply going to a concert or a gig. So these are all factors that distinguish Monterey. And also on top of that, it was filmed for a movie by a very accomplished filmmaker named D.A. Pennybaker. Pennybaker had come out of the alternative left underground film scene as a documentary filmmaker. Famously, he had done the film Don't Look Back about Bob Dylan, another iconic presence of the period. And he seemed like a natural to do the film. And that film, of course, helped spread the news about what had happened at Monterey. There was a famous pop song by Eric Burden in The New Animals called Monterey, which also raced to the, well, I don't know if it was the top of the charts, but it did very well. And it helped spread the seed, almost like Johnny Appleseed, that something special had happened in Monterey. So it continues to reverberate, and every 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there's a, a reunion or a, a celebration of Monterey. But at this particular time, the stars aligned. There was also the fear that to do this book properly and to capture the magic of Monterey, we needed to talk to people now. 
before they left the planet permanently. And you can wait for things like the 50th or the 60th anniversary of any event, but if you want a first-hand accounting, you're going to lose a lot of folks. So the book is not tied into any unique or special anniversary, but rather just a reminder to the culture at large that not only does the ethos of Monterey continue to exist, it was a, all done for charity, people might not know that, and that the foundation that was generated on behalf of the festival continues to this very day to provide monies that are earned through CD sales and DVD sales and anything having to do with Monterey goes into the foundation and goes to scholarships for museums at UCLA, for instance, at uh, uh, the medical center there. They put up a wing that's been sponsored by Monterey. The new West Hollywood Public Library is going to have a section dedicated to Monterey and Lou Adler. So it continues to resonate in a kind of a good works thing. And it also inspired other big festival events like the Bangladesh Festival that George Harrison famously put on was inspired by Monterey, another foundation event. Even Live Aid, the legendary festival, comes out of a tradition of musicians giving back to the community and that all began at Monterey. One of the things that one takes away from the whole Monterey experience is again how vital, alive, and timeless it is. It's not just simply dressing up on Halloween in a tie-dye shirt and pretending that it's all peace, love, and understanding. At that time, the world was not that peaceful a place. And even though the musicians and the community came together to celebrate the music, there was an undercurrent of darkness in terms of war, both social and economic, and huge cultural gyrations taking place. So it's wholly fitting that an event that's come to define Monterey at a particular period can be resurrected, here we are these many decades later, in a contemporaneous setting where the world is also experiencing a variety of cultural, social, economic, and political gyrations, and that the music not only communicates across generations, but the sensibility of the audiences and, and who can take away from that experience something that you can feed upon and see the through line and to feel that it's all part of a, a contiguous line that we have a responsibility as citizens of a society to not only celebrate the arts, the better angels of our nature, you might say, in terms of what we can produce when we get our acts together, and be mindful of what happens when things go awry and try and, 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 and right the ship, and that music, I would argue, and the arts in general are the best way I know of to find uh, common ground and, and to, uh, to make sense of a world that's kind of wacky.